The children are invited to their worship time, and you may be seated. So, um, about three years ago, uh, my father died. Uh, he had uh, a cancer scare five years earlier. He had a spot on his ear and a spot in his colon. In typical Dick Delashbet style, he only told me after he had two surgeries and a round of chemo. Uh, that year, uh, feeling triumphant, he called me on New Year's Day and he said, Mike, I beat cancer twice in one year. Well, fast forward five years, uh, the cancer had come back with a vengeance. Uh, he received a stage four diagnosis in early 2018, and his funeral was in May of 2019. My family is all from Iowa, though all of my immediate family, my sisters, my mother, and I had moved to the coasts about 30 years earlier. Uh, we flew in from all parts to meet up for the funeral, to reconnect with our extended family and to uh, meet with old family friends. After the graveside service uh, in, our fam in our town's very small rural cemetery, where generations of Delashmuts have been laid to rest, we drove out deeper yet into the Iowa country for a small reception at a local winery. Now, <laughs> as an aside, if you've never heard of Iowa wine before, there is probably a reason. Uh, the vibe was certainly more Omaha than Sonoma, um, but nonetheless, it was a, a nice gathering. That said, I'm not a big fan of uh, uncomfortable social events like this, and small talk is not really my cup of tea. And so in situations like these, my, um, my MO is to try to look busy or to hide somewhere in a corner. So you'll probably notice at like coffee hour, I'm like really busy, you know, filling biscuits or maybe like in a corner somewhere because I don't like small talk a lot. But yet uh, somehow between arranging photos on a card table uh, and uh, making my way with a glass of wine out to an empty terrace, I found myself cornered by an old family friend who had very strong political views. This was pre-COVID midway through the Trump administration, and the issue occupying the news cycle in May of 2019 was immigration. And I'm not sure why this family friend decided that an hour after burying my father was a good time to bring up the southern border, but here I was with a glass of Midwest Merlot in one hand and still wet tissues in my pocket from the graveside, I was being peppered with questions about my political views on border security. What do you think about immigration, he'd ask. Surely we can't let criminals in. What about all these stories that you're hearing on the news that are fake news? Are you pro-terrorist, he'd say to me. Among these many, yeah, it was not a great way to spend a reception after your father's funeral. Just FYI, as far as etiquette goes, leave politics uh, out, out of funerals. Among the many frustrating things in this scenario was the way in which a complex, multifaceted human rights issue was being weaponized into political rhetoric. Moreover, the goal of this rhetoric was not really to come to any kind of mutual understanding, consensus, uh, shared, a shared appreciation of the complexities of an issue. Rather, it was purely to debate. What mattered to this family friend was that my political views could be demonstrably wrong and his political views could be demonstrated as correct. His side wins, my side loses. Strangely enough, this rhetorical warfare is exactly the kind of thing that we see in our gospel reading this morning. The Sadducees are trying to box Jesus in on an issue that pits the resurrection of the body against the protection of widows. So in our reading from Luke, we encounter Jesus in the last few days, possibly last few weeks of his public ministry. He has already arrived in Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, and in a few short chapters, we'll find him on his way to be charged in front of Pontius Pilate. We find him here confronted in the temple by a group that we know as the Sadducees. Now in the world of first century Roman occupied Palestine, the world of Jesus and his disciples, it was a world full of diverse religious and political groups. The Gospels share with us stories about groups like the scribes or the priests or the zealots 
or tax collectors or Pharisees, Sadducees, just to name a few. Not unlike our own day, these groups reflected very different political and religious values. Was or was not the Roman occupation a good thing? Uh, where, to what extent is the Messiah's arrival a spiritual or political event? What books of the Bible even are the most authoritative and how freely do we interpret them? Now this particular group, the Sadducees, loom large in the Christian imagination. I remember in Sunday school inexplicably learning that the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. Did you learn this or is it just me? Okay. Man, I, I like I that that is like something that's lasted longer than anything I learned in seminary. Probably anything I've taught in seminary. The Sadducees are sad, you see. <laughs> so we don't we don't know a lot about them actually outside of the New Testament and outside of our knowledge of their uh, particular views on the resurrection. It's thought that they had some kind of connection to the, the priestly class. Uh, so that would place them somewhere within the first century Jerusalem aristocracy. They would have had access to power, probably some access to wealth, and, and they would have seen Jesus's ministry, his preaching and healing, his proclamation about this radically inclusive kingdom of God's love, they would have seen this as a threat to the stability that they enjoyed. They were also likely more religiously conservative than other major religious groups at the time, like Jesus and also like the Pharisees, for that matter. So like later Christians, the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, the Pharisees, tended to build their theological imagination from all the books of the Hebrew Bible, and even some in what we would later call the Apocrypha. Unlike the Sadducees, the Pharisees and Jesus and later Christians, preached and taught and believed in things like the bodily resurrection of the dead. And they talked about things like angels and demons and miracles and, and that sort of stuff. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they were Sadducee, uh, they viewed uh, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those books, they said, were the most authoritative and the truly authoritative body of scripture. The rest could be taken lightly. And if you read the Torah, if you read the Pentateuch, you'll see in there stories of God's creation, the calling of Israel, the Exodus, the giving of the law, but there's not a lot ex explicitly spiritual or about the resurrection of the dead or that much about angels and demons in those first five books. So when we meet the Sadducees, who are a more conservative, aristocratic group in the, in the world of Jesus, when we meet them here in Luke 20, it is clear that they have an ideological ax to grind. They're kind of coming up to Jesus at his father's funeral, so to speak. They're not here to make conversation. They're not here to argue a theological point. Well, they are here to make a theological point. They're here to make their own theological point. A point is that they don't believe that the resurrection is possible, principally because the resurrection of the, bo of the body would create some kind of contradiction in the law of Moses, and they'd rather have a consistency in their theology than a great deal of compassion about somebody like a, a widow in, this, in the context of the story. So really what we have here is the Sadducees engaged in a kind of rhetorical warfare with Jesus. So let's, let's read this weird parable or little fable again. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, the first married and died childless, then the second, then the third, and so on. In the same way, the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. It sounds a bit like a fable, or uh, depending on the kind of husbands they were, maybe it's more of a nightmare, I suppose. Not, not exactly the afterlife that a lot of people are looking for. Where this particular viewpoint comes from is a, a, a law in the, in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 25 uh, that covers what's called a Leverite marriage. And you might be wondering, you know, why would, why would someone be commanded uh, to marry uh, the brothers of their, their widower uh, in, in a case like this? Well, the idea behind it is that you wouldn't want to leave 
a woman uh, widowed in the community. And so the best way to secure her uh, safety in the context of this ancient tribal culture would be to ensure that she's married. And you don't want to uh, cause a, a line, a family line to end abruptly. And so ensuring that that line continues through procreation and marriage is, is a significant value in this ancient law. So the law is created to protect and to ensure procreation. So in a sense, the law has people at its heart. But the Sadducees are approaching this in a way to undermine a greater law, a law of God's love. So Jesus' response illustrates that he's turning away from a focus on the letter of the law towards a bigger picture. Jesus says, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy at a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. In other words, the point of this discussion isn't to figure out what our family will or will not be on the other side of death. The point is that when we are raised by God's gracious action, fears of scarcity, fears of death, the need to preserve the unity of the family, all of these things will be wiped away. What matters in the end is the formation of this new community of love where all people are equally valued by the love of God the Father. The Sadducees were focused on the logic of the law and they forgot to see the love of people that, under, uh, that underpins the law. I wasn't with you last week because I was in Rome and I had an audience with Pope Francis. And I'm mentioning this for two reasons. One, it applies to the sermon, and also there's not very many times in life where I get to say I had an audience <laughs> with Pope Francis. And I was participating in a small ecumenical gathering of other Christian leaders who were given a, a, a private meeting with the Pope to discuss themes related to Christian unity across ideological and theological divides. I was the only mainline clergy person in the group that included a lot of non-denominational Christians and some Roman Catholic Christians and a small number of other progressive Christians as well. In light of the division that I felt within myself at, at this meeting, because the kind of different theological and ideological lines were very much on the surface of things, um, and uh, as one of the small number of political progressives in this group, uh, and in light of this kind of shared concern about challenges in our deeply politically divided country, uh, we posed a question to the Pope. I posed a question with a friend of mine to the Pope about how to do reconciling ministry across left and right lines. And the Pope's answer was a story that I want to share with you today that I think is germane to both the readings and to also our time uh, in both All Saints Day and on the eve of a midterm election. The Pope told a story about how when he was younger, growing up in Argentina, uh, in his school, if you wrote with your left hand, uh, you'd get smacked by the teachers, that the left hand was seen as the weaker hand, and the right thing to write with would be the right hand. And so calling somebody left or calling somebody right prejudged them. For a person on the left, it judged them in some way as deficient. And then he said, you know, as, as when he became Pope, his papal advisors told him to be wary of, uh, of the cardinals who were on the right because where the left might be a little wishy-washy or deficient, the right could be rigid and dogmatic and inflexible. Either way, we're expressing a prejudice, the Pope said. And rather than prejudging people based on labels that reflect their ideologies or their politics or their theologies, he calls his church to see people at the level of the individual, to orient us towards one-on-one -on -one relationships, which is the place where healing and deliverance and reconciliation and forgiveness and love can most readily be found. I think it's interesting to see how easy it is to weaponize rhetoric, whether political or religious, in a way that obscures the individual behind a party and instead tries to engage in a kind of uh, intellectual exercise that ignores the person. Whether in the time of Jesus with Sadducees, Pharisees, and Zealots, or in our own day with Republicans and Democrats and Independents, the drive to be correct can sometimes push out the bigger picture, the bigger call 
to love our neighbor as persons. So as we conclude this season of midterm elections, in a time where words are used as weapons and being correct seems more important than being loving, I pray that we can be reminded to see the person in the politics and that we can, as we prayed this morning, be reminded that we are knit together in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of, the, of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This time I invite you to stand as you're able as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen.